great, great to be here with you. Uh, AT&T uh, is a customer of Automation Anywhere uh, and has been for quite some time, and uh, we're excited to work with them. In the, uh, in the vein of uh, the discussions we've had this morning about RPA and AI, uh, we uh, have had a very interesting journey with AT&T, and uh, as uh, some of you may know, they have RPA deployed in uh, 77 organizations inside of AT&T with about 400 bots that are operational today. Uh, 2,500 people that have been trained through AT&T University on RPA uh, and have returned about uh, $20 million in value uh, to the organization. So a very exciting uh, journey uh, with, with AT&T. Drew, in, in the spirit of um, the earlier discussion we had about, uh, in, on the panel about RPA and RPA successes, uh, tell us a little bit about how did you, how did you come across um, uh, this as a solution for you? What, what was the problem you were trying to solve at AT&T? Yeah. Uh, for us, it was, you know, we started this journey with really a massive transformation that we were doing as a company. So it wasn't really about, you know, how do I save money for the business or how do I bring in some new technology, but it was really, how do we transform the entire workplace that we have at AT&T? The, the demands of the marketplace are changing. Mm -hmm. The business that we're in is, is transforming. Uh, traditional telecom was based on hardware, network, software, uh, but most of it was geared by switches and routers. Uh, these things were special purpose. They were made for a unique purpose. Uh, that's what drove our business. Now what we're seeing is hardware is a lot cheaper. Don't necessarily have to use the same piece of hardware. Software is really driving all the value and all the services on top of what our business model is gonna become. So retooling our workplace, our folks, the several hundred thousand employees that we have was critical for us. RPA was really an enabler for us to be able to retool our employees, right? We wanted them to embrace software. Software was gonna be the center of everything that we do going forward in our company. We needed something that was really easy mm -hmm. for us to teach as well as for people to utilize to bring real meaningful value back to the business. And it was meaningful value, not just from a financial perspective, but really from how do we add value? How did the work, how do we create additional value, not just for our employees, but really for our customers? So RPA was sort of a natural fit here. It allowed us to take care of all the menial tasks and allow our employees to go really concentrate on meaningful servicing of our customers, right? Work the real complex tasks, the things that, that we as humans really want to do, not the data entry uh, often that we're stuck doing, right? So, so, so borrowing the words of uh, Dominic Hope earlier uh, from Credit Suisse, is that it works, do it, uh, do it fast. Your competitors are doing it. Uh, it saves yeah. you money. Would you say that that has been the case in, in your scenario? Yeah, so uh, definitely it works. I think when, when you put it in people's hands, they start to play with it. And when they realize how easy it is to really create pieces of automation, they're going to embrace it a lot faster. You're not going to have to spend the cycles that you have to normally in new initiatives and new programs to try and create promotion or videos or you know, a whole marketing or hype around it. Just give it to people in their hands. That's what we experienced. We gave it to people in their hands and said, go try this. See if you can do something meaningful in your day-to-day -day job. And people embraced it like this. We've got a grassroots movement now. I mean, as you mentioned, several thousand folks that essentially have been trained on RPA. And we get ideas, 10 to 15 ideas of new bots every week. I mean, the opportunity list is, is just unbelievable, right? So the adoption, the reception to RPA has been phenomenal for us, yeah. What was critical for you, uh, given, given that sort of picture that you described of adoption and where you are today, if you dial back, in terms of your decision making as you went out and looked at the, the vast uh, uh, market scape that we have. But what was the dis decision factor for you to decide on how, how to pick vendors, multiple vendors, one vendor? Um, yeah, so, so for us, it was really about scale. We, we wanted to do it widespread. We wanted to do it across the enterprise. We wanted to create a new culture of automation, right? We wanted to get out of this legacy uh, model that we were in investment in old tools and old hardware was just not gonna happen. We needed to invest in our people. So in order to have people start to adopt this faster, it had to be easy. So simplicity was really key for us. We needed to find a tool that was simple enough 
to teach people who are not traditionally automation builders to build automation, right? We needed people who were not coders, who were not programmers, to be able to embrace this. If you think about, you know, a hundred plus year old company, we've got a lot of people, majority of our workforce, a, a, a pretty significant, uh, over 50% of our workforce has more than 10 to 15 years of service with the company. The, these guys are, have been around, uh, you know, from the days where uh, technology just wasn't used, right? To, to drive meaningful work out of their uh, personal satisfaction. I think uh, embracing RPA, embracing a software that allows you to change the way you work has been a key skill that they've wanted to build. They're eager to have this skill. They're able to apply it to their jobs and they're able to use it in new roles that they're taking on as, as technology is evolving, as the company is transforming. So that's interesting, new roles that they're taking on because there's been a lot of talk and perhaps some level of angst around jobs and job, mm -hmm. you know, what happens to jobs and how does talent get replaced or augmented. It's more about talent augmentation, I, I believe. Uh, and that's why we, we, talk, we tend to talk a lot about a digital workforce, which is a, a human workforce augmented with a robotic workforce. How many bots would you say you have operational? Did, did I have the yeah, right number? So or? We've got 400 plus bots that are operational. You know, it, it's not really the number of bots that we have operational. I think it's really the value that we're bringing back to the business, right? It, it's the embracing of the technology that we're seeing on a widespread scale across the enterprise. I mean, we support, at and is a very large company, very siloed in, in parts of the company. Uh, I support 77 different organizations across the company, all embracing RPA. I, I don't have a single organization that says that this is not for me. They're actually coming to me, knocking on my door saying, how do I get signed up? How do I embrace this technology? Here it's working. How do we quickly do this, right? It, it, it's not the numbers of bots, but it's the value. I mean, we've been able to provide multi-million dollars back to the business in terms of cost savings, efficiencies mm -hmm. that we've provided. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just what we've done already, but it's what situation are we in for the future? We're in a position where we're now able to create a bot a day. And that's today's run rate. A year from now, we'll be at exponential value, right? We'd have thousands of bots possibly. Our network could be driven by bots. Our servicing could be driven by bots. The potential is just uh, out there. And it, it's not easy to communicate. Let's put it this way. <laughs> uh, uh, which, the, the, the capabilities are just unlimited. Uh, we, which is a bit challenging though for the next question I was gonna ask you, which is, to, can you communicate to us, uh, give us an example of the uh, a use case, a value that uh, has been driven? Yeah, so RPA in itself today, it, you know, as we're talking about it now, is more about really, you know, menial tasks. Mm -hmm. The copy and paste, stare and compare, let me update multiple systems, let me create reports, these types of things. But when we look at what's the next evolution of RPA? Where's this cognitive machine learning, mm -hmm. AI come into play? The inner working of all of these things together, the capability is gonna be astronomical, right? In today's value, we've seen everything from back office, customer servicing, uh, we've seen driving our network, in, enhancing our security profiles, you name it, we're able to enhance, right? It, there isn't a spot within the company where RPA can't help today. And how important is it for some of the things that you described to have a yeah. enterprise grade level platform yeah. that does that for you? So given that software is gonna lead us from an industry, software is, is what's gonna drive the future of technology innovation. Uh, it, it, it's gonna change the way we communicate. Uh, the onset of uh, network-based, uh, software-based virtualization, removing hardware-based services, uh, the onset of internet of things, uh, software-defined networks, these things really are gonna force us to a point where we can't do anything without software, right? So software is gonna be the, at the helm of everything that we do it's gonna force us to leverage machine learning, AI, cognitive stuff to drive value. The value we're gonna be really driving towards is how do we enhance even further our customer experience, right? And, and how do we do it with security in mind? Mm -hmm. it, it, these solutions are, are really gonna have to be secure. We're talking about possibly removal of human intervention or, or human beings possibly to service our customers. So it's gotta be 
as stable or greater than a human being. You know, security at most uh, has to respect privacy and security uh, greater than a human being does. At the end of the day, if these robots are not waking up, they're not working, we've got a major problem. Our, our business is hampered at that point. So it becomes a mission critical aspect of your business in many ways, would you say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, beyond doubt. <laughs> you know, robots, are, robots will be the way of the future, right? Bot, yeah. Bots are the way of the future for us. Uh, they are mission critical to our operations. They have been for many years. In, in the new form where we're looking at you know, RPA, AI, and machine learning, it's going to drive it even further. Um, so when, you, when I think of AT&T, a uh, very successful um, uh, organization with a strong legacy, um, uh, how challenging is it, would you say, to get the mindshare within the organization to, to drive uh, an RPA process to the success that, that you guys have driven it to? Yeah, so I think the key is you know, taking it with an approach of tying it to other initiatives that you have as an enterprise, right? For us, we were able to easily tie it to a skills pivot that we wanted to do as a company. That helped us get there faster. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, just with the standard approach of here's a piece of software that can automate some work, build some macros or write some scripts, but use a piece of software to do it, wasn't mm -hmm. that appealing at, at the onset. Right? But the ability to say, you know, you need to learn this because we want to change your skill set was very appealing to individuals. It drove adoption. Uh, it, if you think about it from the perspective besides the skill set, it, it is what's going to drive us from an organization. It, it is what's going to drive us from a value perspective. Uh, people want it faster, quicker, and cheaper. There, there wasn't a better way to do this without automation. So automation was key to it. Yeah. R RPA as the starting point in that continual. And the driving force behind it, the, the you know, what it, why is digital workforce critical for you and what does success look like going forward? Yeah, so uh, digital workforce, of course, is gonna be critical for us, uh, but I don't think humans go away, right? So uh, humans are not gonna go away. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully not, I, I'd still need a job, <laughs> right? Uh, but, uh, having a digital labor force that, that can be created on demand as needed and be able to proactively and predictively uh, be deployed is gonna be critical. Uh, a workforce that can be global in nature is mm -hmm. gonna be very, very demanding and, and very critical to our mission right, going forward. So digital workforce is at the helm of everything that we do going forward for us. Okay. Yeah? Why don't we open it up to any questions that you may have in the audience uh, at the moment? So one of the challenges I had from IT is um, what they referred to as the wild, wild west of macros. And so, the, you know, putting it in the hands of 2,500 people in an organization and, and allowing the proliferation, uh, what sort of controls governance do you have in place to, to ensure that you don't end up with that wild, wild west and making sure that the quality of what is built and the robustness of the, of the bots is there? Yeah, so security has to be at the helm of all of this stuff, right? Uh, being able to orchestrate across this, governance across it, uh, having command and control over all the automation pieces that you deliver ha has been very critical for us. Uh, it, it was one of the key reasons why uh, w we chose a solution set that we chose, it, is to make sure that you have those keys at your disposal. Uh, w we have a centralized team that manages and governs across all the automation across the enterprise they have the keys and control to turn anything on and off. Uh, so it was very important for us, yeah. So Drew, can you talk a bit more about um, your journey of scaling up to the level of the people that you have today that drive automation internally? How did you start? How did you train them? Did you use external partners? Did you brought technology in? Did you brought a center of excellence? Talk a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, we have a bunch of different models that we used. Uh, I, I would say we, we have a centralized center of excellence. That central centralized center of excellence really is responsible for governance. Uh, all they do is enable a model, they establish the rules of the program, 
and they provide coaching and guidance across the whole process. But we look for the business themselves to develop the automation, to take up training, mm -hmm. decide on their priorities, make the right decisions on what to automate and what not to automate. Part of that governance model, we established the rules. We established the templates. We provided an ROI model so that people are not just automating three emails a day. What they're doing is automating hours of their work a day. Yeah? And how did you get to train that center of excellence? How did you develop it? Yeah, so we, we, we had to partner with uh, vendors, uh, and we did a lot of it in the house. Today, uh, we, we've got a very large talent development organization. Uh, we, we call uh, that organization at and University. Uh, they developed a curriculum uh, which allows employees to embrace robotics overall as a, uh, as a technology, not just RPA. It, it's RPA is one tool out of the robotics technologies. Yeah. Hi, Drew. I'm Vartul Mittal. I have a question to you. Like you mentioned, you have uh, got around 400 bots in place at the moment. So I have a question like, how did you, did, did you face, uh, face a challenge that uh, what RP solution you need to re-implement uh, or do you need to reevaluate that whether the solution in place is good enough to go further or do you need to get something else in place? Yeah, so uh, I would say there, there's probably not a perfect answer. Uh, there's not a perfect solution out there. But it, it's really you know, what was driving us. For us, we needed something that's scaled, scalable and easy. Uh, so we went down a certain path. Uh, we continue to reevaluate if that's the right path, right? Uh, but what we see is it, not one or another would work, but probably the mix of many solutions to in order to drive the entire continuum of, uh, of technologies as part of robotics, right? So I, I don't believe one vendor, one solution in itself is the answer. I, I think what we need is really a platform that enables multiple vendors to work together. Uh, a, a platform that allows uh, RPA to be called through APIs, a platform that allows us to build machine learning and, and leverage machine learning and cognitive capabilities, speech processing capabilities, to be able to deliver a real full-blown solution. Um, is the RPA Center of Excellence um, a part of IT or is it independent? Uh, like I'm thinking about the context of our organization where, where we're just getting started and it's business driven yeah. and IT is not taking the lead. And I'm a little bit concerned that, um, you know, what we're referring to as governance might turn out to be the roadblocks as opposed to the enablement. Yeah. Yeah, we, we face similar challenges when we started out. We, we started out as part of the business. We're still in part of the business but we're a dedicated organization in the business responsible for delivering technology innovation to the business. Uh, that technology innovation in this form has taken on a role similar to IT's. So we are somewhat doing what they believe is their territory. Uh, but the great partnership that we've been able to build to recognize why IT existed, IT you know, in, in this space can add great value uh, they were, you know, if you think about it, IT's been there to create stability, to provide scale, to be able to make sure that mission critical operations continue. Uh, all of those same principles apply, whether they're in IT or whether they're outside of IT. Uh, where we're located really didn't matter, but the challenges are the same. So w we did face those challenges. It, it's a matter of who's doing the work, not a location of where it's happening, right? It's the same type of work but it's work that we can do in the business because we don't need the same type of skill sets that typically are in IT. The skill sets required to do RPA are, are not developers, coders, programmers type folks, right? As we evolve into the technologies, when we get into machine learning, cognitive, and AI, we're hoping that we can build a, a open uh, and a collaborative environment where this can still continue in the business side of the house versus having to really go to IT. It'll provide us really the agility that we need for our customers. Uh, it'll provide us a better cost structure, uh, possibly will reduce overhead for us as an organization. Right? So that I think there's great value in being really close to the process, being really close to the operation, versus having it happen in a back office environment. 
I have a question. Uh, you said you have 400 robots. What does it uh, exactly mean? Do you have uh, 400 uh, virtual workstations or 400 uh, scripts or equivalent of 400 FTEs uh, replaced by robots? So a, a robot in our terms is a piece or a part of a process or, or an entire process that essentially is doing work that a human being was doing. Uh, not necessarily one-to-one -one equivalents. So one robot doesn't mean a one full-time equivalent of a human body, but it's really a piece of work that a human being was, was doing. Uh, y you can define the robot in any way, shape uh, that you want. Uh, one of the metrics that we, we monitor and manage as part of our RPA organization and our governance model is really the value that we're providing back to the business. And that value is measured in how many full-time equivalents employees worth of work capacity have we created in an automated environment. Uh, we've got several hundred capacity that we've built using RPA to do that. So uh, I go back to say the number of bots, I think it, it you know, doesn't really matter. Uh, it, it does show sort of the scale that we're doing it at and how vast it is across the organization, but the number in itself probably doesn't mean that much. Uh, the number of value that we provide in terms of dollars, in terms of the amount of work that we've done in an automated environment is significant. It's in the couple hundreds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously it's going to be different in a growth environment to a sort of cost reduction environment. Yeah, so we, we didn't lead with using RPA as an FTE reduction plan. We led with RPA as a skill set pivot for the enterprise. That's what helped us in, in terms of adoption, in terms of growth, having this at a scale that we do. Uh, if we led with the reverse of possibly an FTE uh, or a cost savings initiative, which at the end of the day, it, it is providing cost efficiencies to the business, right? It, it's not stated clearly as, you know, people are off the payroll, but it is a way we can repurpose human beings. Uh, we, we have initiatives in place that's wanted us to develop automation. That, this was part of that business case. It was an automation business case, uh, but more or less it was funded because of its skills pivot that we wanted to do. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. So, okay, sure. So did you ever try using uh, IT staff to do the robotics? You know, we, we did so, and having the mindset of being object-orientated and data-driven actually get a lot of value. But did you do the same? Did you try having IT developers using the software? Yeah, so uh, IT's approach was a, uh, to it was quite different than the approach that we took in the business side of the house. Uh, once we started using it on the business side of the house, IT now subscribes to my program, utilizes it to deliver to other business units. So IT sees the value in it. Uh, the approach is a little bit different from an IT perspective versus the business perspective. The business is, is willing to take a lot more risks, I think, in building the automation than IT actually is. Because at the end of the day, I, IT feels that they've got SLAs they've got to live up to, which the business you know, sort of expects when it comes from an IT organization that they pay for when it's part of the business and, you, and you're not giving the money to someone else, you tend to have a little more flexibility in how you use that money and the risk level associated with it. All right. Okay. One you, last one. You had quite many robots in production. Um, when it comes to basically ensuring that they're up and running all the time. Are you proactive or are you, you reactive towards, for example, changes in our, uh, I mean, other uh, IT systems which they rely on? Yeah, so we, we have a proactive and a reactive model. Uh, we have a bot that watches all our bots. So, you know, if you think about uh, the movies where robots are smarter than humans, our bot that's, our, that's called Sassy is smarter than all our other bots because it is the supervisory bot. It watches all our bots, make sure they're running. If they're not running, it wakes one of us up and says, something's wrong with a bot, please fix it, right? So we are proactive in that sense. From a reactive sense, we have processes in place just like any uh, mission critical system would have in place. If there was a breakage, what we would do. Yeah. Excellent.
Well, I want to thank Drew for a real uh, life example of how RPA has been uh, successful at uh, AT&T. And we will leave it back to you, to Sassy and virtual bots talking to each other. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks.